this video we are going to directly carry on from the previous video where we derived the Maxwell boundary conditions and we are going to use this to derive the four Fresnel equations. And these equations essentially tell us what portion of the light that enters a different refractive index medium gets reflected and what portion gets transmitted through the boundary. And as I said in the last video, these equations can be a little bit algebraically intense. However, once you've done them once, you will probably never have to look at them again and you will understand exactly how this mechanism, which is quite important to lots of different areas of physics, works. So without further ado, let's go ahead and jump right into it. So in the last video, we derived the four results that different components of both the electric and displacement field, as well as the magnetic and magnetic intensity fields, transport across the boundary in slightly different ways. And so we got the result that the normal component of D is continuous across the boundary, and the normal component of B is continuous across the boundary. However, for the other two fields, which is the E and H field, we found that it was the tangential component that transported across the boundary in both cases. And so these are the four results we are going to be using in order to derive the Fresnel equations. So let's go ahead and redraw our diagram for a ray which is coming in at an angle upon a boundary between two different dielectric media. Now, when we think back to what we said about electromagnetic waves, we said that the direction of propagation right here so in this case, for the instant wave, the direction of propagation would be in this particular direction. We said that both of the electric and magnetic fields were both right angles to this direction right here, but they were also right angles to each other right here. So that basically means that there is a essentially a plane of possible orientations for both the electric and magnetic field. So just for example, you know, if we have, say, the direction of propagation coming out of the paper, and we'd normally denote this by saying that the k vector, the wave vector, which is also the same as the direction of propagation, is coming out of the vector, then you could have any number of combinations for the electric and magnetic fields, as long as they are right angles. So you could have the electric field oscillating in this direction and the magnetic field oscillating in this direction, all within the plane, but you could also have it such that the electric field is in this direction and the magnetic field is in this direction. So you have essentially loads of possibilities. However, whenever we have this kind of situation where we have lots of different possibilities for the orientations, we can always say that we can resolve these possibilities into essentially two axes. And this is what gives rise to two different types of propagating electromagnetic radiation when we're going to talk about boundary conditions. And we call this the polarization of the light. And it's kind of the direction of oscillation of both the electric field and the magnetic field right here. Now, of course, in reality, light coming in will probably be polarized in all sorts of different directions. That's typically what we observe. We observe unpolarized light. When we look at light, it's probably unpolarized unless it's been especially polarized by some kind of filter. However, we can always resolve any unpolarized light into two different orthogonal directions. That is to say, all light can be resolved into a vertical and a horizontal component of polarization. So how is this going to apply to this situation right here? Well, we can define a type of polarization along here where the electric field is essentially oscillating in the plane of the diagram right here. And so if the direction of propagation is along this direction, and the oscillation direction is up and down, sort of out of the plane, then that must essentially mean that the magnetic field is going to be oscillating in this direction in order to keep everything at right angles to each other. And so when you do the cross product, you find that it actually oscillates in this direction right here. So the E field is oscillating in and out of the plane, the B field is oscillating like this, 
and the direction of propagation of the wave is down on this axis right here. And so everything is at right angles. And this would be similar for the case over here with the reflected wave. We'd have the E field still oscillating in and out of the plane, but the B field will actually be oscillating in this direction right here. And similarly for the transmitted wave, we find that the magnetic field is in this direction and the electric field is still oscillating in and out of the plane. So the electric field is essentially always going to be at right angles to both the magnetic field and the direction of propagation. So this is actually one case. However, of course, you could have the other case where rather than the electric field oscillating in and out of the plane, you have the magnetic field oscillating in and out of the plane. So when we draw this out, this will essentially look something like this right here. So now we can see that the B field is oscillating in and out of the plane, but the E field is oscillating perpendicularly to both the direction of propagation and the B field right here. So essentially there are kind of two orthogonal possibilities for the polarization when we're considering light, which is going in at an angle towards the boundary between two different media. So we often call the top orientation because the electric field is in the same plane as the boundary. We call this transverse electric or TE polarization right here. And similarly, for the bottom case, because the magnetic field is in the same plane as the boundary, we call this transverse magnetic polarization right here. And you can sometimes see this being called S and P polarized light. However, I kind of find that a little bit more difficult to remember than TE and TM. But the top orientation is essentially called S polarized light. And the bottom orientation can sometimes be called P polarized light right here. But typically I find it a little bit easier to go by transverse electric and transverse magnetic simply because that kind of tells you what you're dealing with a little bit more. So we actually have two different cases for this kind of thing. And this will actually give rise to two different sets of Fresnel equations with two of the four equations corresponding to TE light and the other two equations corresponding to TM light right here. So first of all, we are going to do the derivation for TE light, and then we are going to go ahead and essentially repeat the same derivation for TM light. So let's go and do that. So I've drawn in the configuration, and I've also drawn in the electric field vector. However, I'm going to draw in the magnetic field vector, but it's actually this vector that we need to do some more inspection on because the E vector is essentially always going to be at right angles. So we don't really need to resolve anything. But in this case, for TE light, we actually need to resolve the magnetic field vectors with respect to the boundary axes. So, like I said, the actual B vector will be pointing in this direction right here. And I'll be calling the B vector that's incident BI right here. And same goes for the other two B vectors. This is going to be the reflected magnetic field right here. And this right here is going to be the transmitted B vector right here. And I'll just put in the subscripts for the electric field just so that we are clear. Now, here's where the notation starts to get a little bit complicated. I'm now going to resolve each of the B vectors, so the incident, the reflected, and the transmitted v B vectors, into essentially two components. So there's going to be a component along this axis, and there's going to be a component along this axis. And I'm going to denote them as the normal and the tangential components, just like we did in the last video. So when I do that, I will get these right here. So just to be really clear, the first subscript will be denoting whether it's a normal or a tangential component of the vector. And the final component will be denoting whether it's the reflected, the incident or the transmitted. However, we can, of course, use some Pythagoras and some trigonometry in order to express these components of the B vectors in terms of their 
respective angles, because of course we have theta i, theta r right here, and theta t right here. So if this angle right here is the incident angle, then that means that due to the alternate angle law, this angle right here is also theta. And because this angle plus this angle right here has to equal 90 degrees, that must mean that this angle right here is theta i. And so therefore we can say that the cosine of the incident angle is equal to the tangential component bti divided by the magnitude, which is just b right here, the magnitude of our incident field. And it's important to note that yes, the magnetic field will be oscillating in time, so there will actually be an e to the i kr minus omega t. However, we're just going to consider the amplitudes for now because that's the important bit. And so we can actually express bti as being equal to b times cos of theta i right here. Well, if the cosine was the tangential component, then it's fairly easy to see that the normal component will actually be the sine of the incident angle. So let's go ahead and write that out. And I just forgot to note that this is the incident subscript right here. So I'll just put this as a subscript right here. And this kind of cosine relationship is also going to be true for both the reflected and the transmitted B field. So when you work out the trigonometry on both this and this, you find that the tangential component is going to be the cosine of theta and the normal component is going to be the sine of this angle right here. So there we go, we have all of our components now expressed as a function of the angles right here. So now that we've done that, we can now start to apply the boundary conditions to this. And the two boundary conditions we are going to use, we said that for the electric field, it is the tangential components that transport across the boundary. So that means that the tangential component in medium one is equal to the tangential component in medium two right here. Now we have the magnetic field right here, and we also want to apply the magnetic boundary condition. However, we know that for magnetic fields, it doesn't quite work like this. We actually find that it is the tangential component of the H field that transports across. However, in a lot of cases in electromagnetism, the magnetic response of the material is actually very negligible. And what does that mean mathematically? Well, that essentially means that the relative permeability, and this is going to be true for this case right here, is actually equal to 1. And so how is that going to affect the boundary conditions? Well, if mu r is equal to 1, then that essentially says that b is equal to mu naught times the h field right here. And so if they're directly related to each other, then if the tangential component of H transports across the boundary, then that also says that the tangential component of B transports across the boundary as well, because there's no sort of multiplying factor that we actually have to consider. So although I derived that in the general case, H T1 is equal to H T2, in most cases, you actually find that the tangential component of B actually transports across. And so we're actually going to be using this right here for our boundary conditions problem. And so let's go ahead and apply these two boundary conditions for our reflected wave right here. And so this is where we have to be a little bit careful about the signs that we are choosing right here. Let's first of all take the electric case. Well, the electric case is the easier one of the two because, of course, this one is oscillating always perpendicularly. And so essentially what we can do is we can just sum together all of the electric fields on either side of the boundary. So we find that the incident electric field plus the reflected electric field is equal to the transmitted electric field because, of course, all of the electric fields in the first medium equal all the electric fields in the second medium. But this was easy because the electric field was always at right angles and so we were always going to get the maximum. For the magnetic case, it's slightly more complicated. So if we look at our diagram, we find that the reflected magnetic field is actually undergoes a sign change. And this is an important thing, is that when something gets reflected, the phase of the wave actually shifts by 
180 degrees or pi radians. So when we're summing together the magnetic fields, we actually have to not only take into account the component that we are interested in, but also the sign change. So we are going to get r cos theta i minus the reflected wave, because of course there's this phase shift, cos theta r is equal to b t times cos theta t right here. But in the previous video, we said that the magnetic field and the electric field, the magnitude of them, are simply related by the expression that b is equal to n, the refractive index, times e divided by c right here. This equation simply popped out using the definition of the refractive index and knowing that the magnetic field is in fact way smaller, a, speed, a factor of the speed of light times smaller than the electric field. And so we can actually use this to replace all of the magnetic field terms with electric field terms right here. And so I'm going to substitute in this into the magnetic field balanced equation right here. And so when, when I do that, I'm going to get this right here. One very important thing to note is that when I've added in the refractive index, I've actually made sure to use the refractive index with respect to the medium that we're in. And here's the key thing, for both the incident and the reflected wave, we are in medium one, but for the transmitted wave, we are in medium two. And so therefore I use the relevant refractive index for what medium we're in. So right away, we can see that the C's are all gonna cancel out right here. And I'm actually gonna make some slight simplifications and some changes to this equation. So hopefully we all know that the angle of incidence is equal to the angle of reflection right here. And so this theta i is essentially exactly the same as this theta r. And so what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to change both of these thetas and call them theta 1 right here. And you can think of this as the angle that's in medium 1. And it applies for all of the waves that are in medium one, in this case, the, ref the incident and the reflected wave. But of course, the angle of refraction is different, given by Snell's law. And so I'm going to rename theta t to be theta two right here. And you can think of that as the angle that light makes in the second medium. And that is, of course, going to be different to that in the first medium. So we have this result right here. However, we know that EI plus ER is equal to ET from this electric field equation right here. And so what we can do is we can, rather than writing ET here, we can substitute in EI plus ER. And so when we do that, we get this equation right here. And so now all we've got to do really to get our first result is just to rearrange this equation and get all the terms with the incident electric field on one side and get the reflected field on the other side. And so after doing all this rearranging, we get this right here. And so if we divide both sides by the incident wave and then rearrange, we get this equation right here. And you'll be pleased to know that this right here is the first of the four Fresnel equations. And this right here, as you can see, is describing the ratio of the incident electric field and the reflected electric field. So this is some kind of reflection coefficient right here. And we often call this the reflection, literally that, just the reflection coefficient for S polarized light or transverse electric light right here. So I'm just gonna call this RS right here. And this is the ratio of the amplitudes of the electric fields. So how tall the reflected wave is with respect to how tall the incident wave is. So that is the first equation, but we can quite easily get the second equation by instead of substituting for the transmitted wave right here, we can actually just go ahead and substitute for the reflected wave right here. And so when we do that, we get this result right here. And so hopefully you can see that it's kind of this term that's changed right here. So instead of writing this as ER, this is now ET minus EI right here. 
and you'll notice that er doesn't appear anywhere in this equation and we have everything in terms of et and ei rather than er and ei and so we're just going to kind of do exactly the same thing get all the terms with ei on one side and get all the terms with et on the other side and so when we work through all that we get this result right here and the key point is for this left hand side, we can see that we have two n1 cos theta ones. And so they essentially double up to become a two n1 cos theta one right here. And so doing exactly what we did as for the previous equation, getting the ratio between the two electric fields, we get that ET divided by EI is equal to this result right here. And this is the second equation that Fresnel derived. And this we can see right here is, rather than the reflection, this is the transmission coefficient right here. And this is of course for S polarized light. And so, as you can see, rather than having two subtractions, we actually just have a single term in the numerator and the same denominator as before. And so there we go. That is all our work done for the S polarization or the transverse electric polarization of light. And now we have to do the same thing, but in this case for P polarized light. However, now that you've kind of seen it once, hopefully you'll see that this is essentially the same process. And so hopefully this time it'll be a little bit quicker. So here we go. Here is our diagram for the transverse magnetic case. And we can see that it's essentially the same, only reversed. So now we have the magnetic field that's oscillating in and out of the plane. And so it's actually going to be the electric field, which we're now going to have to resolve in the axes of the boundary right here. So in a very similar way before, we are going to resolve the electric field into its normal components and its tangential components with respect to the boundary. And so when we do that, we get this right here. So just like, again, we did before, we are now going to write the electric field components in terms of the magnitude of the electric field amplitude and the angles. So that would be the angle of instance, angle of reflection and angle of transmission. And so we can see that this angle right here is going to be the angle of incidence. And so therefore, if this angle is the angle of incidence, then we can say that this angle right here is the angle of incidence. And so we again get that cosine of the angle of instance is equal to adjacent divided by hypotenuse, which is going to be the tangential component divided by the magnitude right here. And so therefore we get that for any of the tangential components, this will be equal to the magnitude multiplied by cosine of whatever the angle is. And that will apply for all of them. So we, we get that uh, ET i is equal to e i times cos theta right here. And similarly, when we work out the sine of theta, this is going to equal the normal component divided by the magnitude right here. And so therefore, e n i is equal to e i times cos theta i right here. That should have been an i right there. And yeah, like I said, we can go ahead and repeat that for both the reflected and the transmitted electric fields. So there we go. There's our, all of our results. And now we are going to apply the boundary conditions. So as we said before, the tangential components transport across the boundary. So ET1 is equal to ET2. And likewise, in this case, because we don't have a magnetic a material which has a large magnetic response, and that will be the case for most materials, the transverse magnetic field will actually also transport across the boundary like that. And so those are our two boundary conditions. So we are going to then go ahead and write out what the total electric and magnetic fields are on both sides of the boundary and then equate them. And so that's going to give us our two equations. So for the magnetic case, then we have quite easily, because of course that's right angles to everything, so we don't really have to think about any angles, the incident magnetic field plus the reflected magnetic field is going to be equal to the transmitted magnetic field. But in this case, it's the electric field that we have to think about the complicated angly stuff. And so when we do that, we get that the incident electric field times the cosine of theta 
minus, of course, because we have that phase shift, the reflected electric field times the cosine of theta is equal to the transmitted electric field times the cosine of the transmitted angle right here. But of course, like we can then go ahead and use the result that the B field is equal to N divided by C times the E field. And so we could go ahead and swap out everything in the first equation and get that in terms of the electric field right here. And so when we do that, we get this result right here. Obviously, I've used the relevant refractive index depending on which boundary it's in. So like I said before, the C's cancel. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to rearrange this equation for the transmitted electric field right here. And so when I rearrange this, I find that the transmitted electric field is equal to N1 over N2 times the incident and the reflected fields added together. And notice how this is slightly different to what we had before, where we found that the transmitted electric field for S polarized light was actually just EI plus ER. However, changing the orientation actually changes the way in which the electric fields transport across the boundary in this case. And so now we have to multiply by this N1 over N2 factor. So just noting a small difference right there. And now what we can do is we can substitute that into this equation right here. And when we do that, we're going to eliminate ET temporarily. So this is going to produce the reflection equation. And then afterwards, we'll go on to do the transmission equation. So when we do that, we get this right here. So like we did before, we're just going to go ahead and swap out the I's and R's and T's for medium one and medium two right here. And again, like we did before, we're going to get everything with EI on one side of the equation, and then we're going to get everything with ER onto the other side of the equation. And so when we do that, we get this result right here. And again, finally, the very last step, just to rearrange it in terms of ER over EI, which will obviously give us the reflection coefficient, we get this result right here, where, of course, this is all now equal to the reflection coefficient for p-polarized light or transverse magnetic light. And so there we go. We have our third Fresnel equation right here, the third of the fourth one. And of course, this is slightly different to the first one. And the only difference is that the ones and the twos are slightly shuffled around within the refractive indices and the thetas right here. And so this will actually produce slightly different observable physics, which we'll talk a little bit more about in the next video. But for now, we're just going to go ahead and plow on through and then just finish off the Fresnel equations and get our fourth and final Fresnel equation. To do that, we are just going to go ahead and instead of substituting for ET, we're going to go and substitute for ER. So from this equation right here, we get that... ER is equal to N2 over N1 ET minus EI right here. And substituting this equation into this equation right here, we get this result right here. And yet again, exactly the same trick. We're just going to go and swap out the theta I and theta R for theta 1, just because angle of instance equals angle of reflection and the transmitted angle as theta 2. So when I do that, and I also tidy it up a little bit, we get this right here. And yet again, same thing, just get all the stuff with EI on one side and all the stuff on E with ET on the other side. So that's going to give us this right here. And of course, we see yet again, the N1 cos theta 1s double up. And so dividing both sides by ET, just to get the ratio between ET and EI, we get this result right here, where, of course, this is now the transmission coefficient for p-polarized light or transverse magnetic light. So there we go. This is our fourth and final Fresnel equation. And that kind of completes the set. So we now have four equations two of which are describing transverse electric light or S-polarized light, 
two of which are describing transverse magnetic light or P polarized light. So there we go, that was a hell of a lot of work, but I hope you guys all managed to follow along with all that algebra. In the next video, we're gonna be doing a slightly algebraically less intense video, I'm thankful to say, and we are actually just gonna be analyzing the consequences of the four Fresnel equations and analyzing some special cases, because this is actually what gives rise to some quite cool optical effects. So I hope that was really helpful, and I'll see you guys in the next video. Take care.